So thanks, Hannah, again, for joining us. There were some great questions that came up from Tuesday. So you're going to go over those now, and then we'll, we'll answer any uh, others' questions. Thanks for joining us. Sure thing. All right, I'm going to just do a quick screen share, so bear with me for one minute. I know you're looking at a picture of my desktop for a second. Hold on. There we go. So one of the questions that came up yesterday was how to switch your account type um, on Instagram. And so I just wanted to give, it's super easy to do. I just wanted to give a quick overview of how to do that. Um, so if you're looking at your Instagram homepage, this is just my personal profile, um, and you'll see there are three, this first dot here where there's three little lines up there, what I call the hamburger menu. Um, you click on that and it will take you to this next page where you'll see, you know, settings, archive, insights, click on settings. When you scroll down on your settings screen, you'll see um, a button that says account. And when you choose account, you'll have to continue to scroll down to the bottom and you'll see a little button that says switch account type. When you click on that, it's going to give you whatever options you have. So my account is currently a creator account. So it's telling me I could switch to a personal account or I could switch to a business account. If your account is currently a personal account, the options you might see are creator and business. If you're already a business account, you'll only see personal and creator. Um, so you just choose the type of account that you'd like to switch to and it will, everything will switch over and you're good to go. So it's really simple. Um, one other question that came up yesterday that I just wanted to quickly run through was around these branded hashtags. Um, and someone had asked like how to find them. Uh, so, and, or how to know if it's already being used. So here's an example of a client that I work with called Dental Herb Company. Um, they just use the hashtag dental herb. Again, these can be clever and fun, or they can just be super simple. Sometimes super simple is better because it's easier for people to remember. Um, and they put their hashtag right here in their bio, which you'll see on the right side. And that's something that I definitely recommend including your branded hashtag in your bio. Um, the way that we oh. made sure that that hashtag was going to work was you just go into the search feature on Instagram and you'll see there's a couple of options. So I'm looking at the left side of the screen now. There's um, top accounts, tags, places. So um, navigate to the tags section, that's short for hashtags, and type in your idea for a hashtag and it will show you that hashtag and related hashtags and it will show you how many posts there are on each. So this one for dental herb has 166. That's because we've been using it for a while. When we first started using it, there wasn't anything there. Um, so we knew that we could sort of own that hashtag. If you type something in, like let's say you want to use hashtag, hashtag just do it, you're going to go in and there's going to be you know 300 million posts on hashtag just do it. That's not something you can add. You'll never be able to find sort of your content in that pile of posts. Um, so generally I'm looking for something that has like a hundred or fewer current posts on it. Are there any questions about that? I'm going to unshare my screen so that I can see people raising their hand. Is that clear? That I'm, oh, we have two screens here. Sorry, I'm trying to check. Um, all right, so it seems like that makes sense to people. So that's all that I wanted to cover from uh, the- Vera has a question, Hannah. Sorry about that. Yeah. Hi there, thanks for being here. Uh, so I've been going through my account and at one point it, it's uh, about uh, aligning handles and I was doing the uh, account center. And um, so how do you align handles in Facebook and Instagram? Yeah, it can be a little bit tricky. It depends on you. First, you have to see if something's available. So I guess your first decision is deciding what handle you want to have. So if you have a different handle on Facebook than you have on Instagram, you're going to want to decide like which one of those you want to go with. And part of that decision might be whether or not the 
that handle is available on the other platforms. So if I am, you know, at Hannah's Soaps on Instagram and at Hannah's Soap Company on Facebook, let's say I want to just go with Hannah's Soaps, I'd have to check to make sure that that's actually even available to me on Facebook. Because with account handles, unlike your account name, which there can be multiple people named Hannah Richards on Facebook, obviously there are, your actual handle is unique. Um, so if somebody else is already using at Hannah's soaps, I won't be able to use that. So the first step is to check if it's, um, if it's available. And then if it is available, the process is a little bit different depending on if you're changing it on Instagram. If you're changing it on Instagram, you can just go ahead in and edit. You click edit on your profile and you can actually change your, um, at handle. Uh, Instagram, if you try to change it to something that's taken, Instagram will just tell you this name is already taken. You can't use it. Um, if it accepts the name that you put in, then you're good to go. But the one thing to remember is that everything that links to your existing profile, that link is now going to be broken. So you have to go back to your website and everywhere else just that you're linking to your Instagram page just and this. change that. Um, if you're changing it on Facebook, it's a little bit, uh, it, it's a similar process. Um, Facebook has like a short approval process for the name change. So you'll submit it. And then they say, I think like one to three days, they'll tell you if it's approved. But in my experience, a lot of times um, it will get approved immediately, but it just depends on the situation. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Any other, any other questions that I can answer? I know I went through a lot of the content yesterday really fast, so. I have a question. Sure, Genevieve. Um, sorry, I tried to use the reactions, but I didn't see where there was a way to ask a question. Could you just describe um, the difference between a creator and a business? Uh, like I understand from the first session that if you're a creator, you can access that music library. Um, what other differences are there? The main difference is in how the sort of how robust the analytics are that you're offered and also the contact options that you have. So when you have a business account, you have more um, options for buttons that you can include on your profile for people to contact you. Um, with uh, additionally, you get access to deeper insights into analytics around who's seeing your content and how they're interacting with it. Um, and a creator has some analytics, but slightly less than a business account would. They also do have a contact button, but again, they don't have like a, um, a, a location, like an address or anything like that. So it's just slightly fewer um, contact options but they're pretty similar in a lot of ways. Anna, um, Jennifer's asking if there's a way to reverse track everywhere your Twitter handle is linked. Like if I wanna change my handle, is there a way to see all the links that will break? That's a good question. Um, not that I know of, which doesn't mean that that doesn't exist. Um, there's a lot of stuff out on the internet. So I'd have to just, I'd probably Google it and just see if some, someone's built some kind of bot out there that can do that, but not that I'm aware of. So we have just have a manual process of going through and you know, there's sort of the obvious places like your website, um, other social media profiles where you'd wanna make sure that those links are changed. But the hard part is, Oh, Alexa's talking to me. That's fun. Um, the other thing that I would, um, that's hard about it is if other people have linked to your profile. So if people are writing on their blogs about your work or something like that, and they've linked to your account, you don't have a way to go in and fix those links beyond emailing them and saying, hey, would you mind changing this? So that's sort of a, a tougher call. Um, there's also some, 
implications in terms of if you rank really high on Google for certain terms. So let's say you have a blog post or something that like gets um, a ton of traction and you're changing links in it, Google, it might take a, a while for Google to sort of recognize your social profiles and, and um, rank them again. It does happen, but it just will take a little bit of time. So you might, if you get a ton of Google search traffic to your social pages, you might see um, a small drop in that. But again, if we're talking about accounts that have, you know, 100, 500, maybe 1,000 followers, it's not going to be something that you notice. That would be something more for like really larger accounts that generate a lot of Google search traffic. Um, Colin? Hi. Um, um, could we go over the, the um, the process to make your um, page have purchasable, you know, the, the buying option? Yeah, I'm not sure, Lisa, I sent to you guys, and I don't know um, if you have an email list that you can distribute to the group. It's a pretty lengthy process, so it would take probably more than this session to go through and do it. And it's also pretty unique to each situation, but I did send um, a link to Lisa that has a step-by-step -step tutorial on how to do that. And so what I would suggest is um, taking a look at that link. Maybe we can have it sent out to the whole group and uh, you can try walking through that. And then if there's questions and you wanna send them over, I can try to help with that. Um, okay. And you said you, you do have to have it set up as a business, not the creator. So that was originally true. Although I will say when I was doing a little bit of research last night, it looks like there is some form of shopping available to creators. What I'm, and uh, that's relatively new. What I'm not sure is whether you can actually add your own library of products or if it's shoppable, i.e. you can tag other brands in your post, tag their, their shoppable content. So I haven't gotten to the bottom of yet that yet, but until I looked at that the other day, um, what was true in the past is that you had to have a business account to have shoppable posts. Um, and the other reason is for that is that I believe you need a business account to um, connect it to your business manager, your Facebook business manager account, which is where you actually set up the shopping. Okay. Um, sorry to keep, keep That's okay. initiating more questions. The, so, and I, I know someone else just asked about the comparison, comparison between the creator account and business account, but yesterday you encouraged the creator account, but also the, sh the shopping. Yeah, it's not that one is better than the other, honestly. Like they're just for different purposes. A, a cre and I would not, if you are truly a business and you're selling products, I would have a business account. Okay. Like having a, cre calling it a creator account just so that you can access music. Like eventually Instagram's going to close that loophole, right? Because that's technically a copyright violation if you're using it for a commercial business. The reason creators can use it is because like for me, I have a creator account. I don't sell anything on Instagram or a product. I will sometimes promote products that I have partnerships with brands and do something like that. Um, but I'm not, you know, a commercial business that's selling something. And that's like what the creator accounts are intended for. Uh, but the, the music thing is just a licensing issue. And so some businesses use that as sort of a loophole. Um, or, or nonprofits will sometimes use it. But if you're trying to sell things on Instagram, I would, I would have a business account. Excellent, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm trying to see where the raised hands are. Let's see. Um, oh, it looks like Jody has a question about um, the easiest way to gain followers. Yeah, <clears throat> um, I wondered, um, you know, I've been, what I've been doing is, um, Every day I uh, spend about, I don't know, well, I actually do it when I'm, and I have a Zoom meeting I go to every every day at noon. So I scroll through my, my feed and try to like follow people that I think might follow me back. But I'm wondering if there's, I mean, how this person you showed the other day had 21,000 followers. I, I'm up to 3,000, which is pretty good, but which I've gotten through the pandemic. But um, I'm just wondering what what you have to say about that. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not easy. Um, there's not a magic way to do it, to be honest. I can give you a couple of ideas that can help, but it's really a combination of things. Um, 
So one of them, one of those things is PR, right? So as much as you can get, you know, your name out through other avenues and then include, you know, always making sure that you're reminding people to follow you on social media, having your handle, you know, on your website, on your business card, um, potentially when you sell, if you sell physical products, having some kind of little um, note or something in there that has your social media handles. Um, so finding other ways to kind of get that out there. Um, another, so the, the core things that I would say is create good content. So everyone's always trying to manipulate the Instagram algorithm and figure out this, that, and the other thing. And it changes all the time. The bottom line is if you create good content that people are interested in seeing, it mm -hmm. will work its way to the top. Um, so creating a lot of content, creating good content and creating valuable content. So things that people actually want to know and are interested in. Um, there's other things, you know, in terms of making sure your existing audience already follows you, like making sure, you know, if you have an email list, tapping those people and saying, Hey, come follow me here. Other things that you can do. Um, again, we talked a little bit, I know it was fast yesterday about working with influencers. So finding people who are sort of in your space that are, that either have a large following, like are a traditional sort of social media influencer and have a large following, and you might offer to send them free product, or we also work with influencers on a paid basis where they're paid a fee to post about a product. Um, that exposes your brand to their entire audience. So that's one way. And then also finding brands that are sort of the peanut butter to your jelly. So figuring out someone who's not a competitor to you, but works in a similar space or has a complementary product and partnering with them to, you know, you post about them and expose your followers to their page and they do the same oh, and that can okay. help bring in new people. And then the, th the final thing that you can do, um, well, two things. Another one is giveaways. This is a big one. So the tricky part is that you wanna, you, you wanna uh, promote the giveaway because otherwise you're just, the only people that are seeing it are the people that already follow you. So again, honestly, probably the biggest way to gain new followers is through Facebook or Instagram ads. Um, okay. And that will get your content in front of a targeted audience that you think would be interested in your product, but, but hasn't seen it before. And so you can do giveaways that ask some, you know, in order to enter, they follow your page, that kind of thing. That's a great way to get people to follow. And then the last thing I was going to say, which sounds like it's something you're maybe already doing, but is going on and just interacting with people. So if there's other products that are, again, complementary or similar to you, or if you can think of another brand that has a lot of followers that you think their followers would also like your brand or your product, you can go in and follow some of those people or I comment on their photos, things like that. And a lot of times that at least piques their curiosity to see who you are and come look at your page. And if they like what they see, then, then they might choose to follow. So setting aside a little bit of time each day to just you know, interact is, is a big thing. But I, I would say, you know, when you're looking at pages that have huge numbers of followers, some of that is, is built through ads and some of that is built through um, influencer giveaways, I think are probably the biggest things. Okay. But you don't recommend paying somebody to get you followers because definitely those, not. I would, those so those things pop up um, all the time too, right? Yeah. So paying for followers has a, first of all, it's technically like against Instagram's code of contact conduct. So if they found out that you were doing it, you could get banned from Instagram. Um, the second major downside to that is when you pay for followers, a lot of times you're getting spam accounts because these companies oh, yeah. that sell followers basically just have people create tons and tons of fake accounts. Oh. And then they follow whatever accounts are paying for followers from those spam accounts. A lot of times they're not real people. Even if they are real people, a lot of times they have no interest in whatever your product or service is. And what happens is it actually ends up hurting you in the algorithm. Because if you have 10,000 followers and 8,000 of them are purchased and they have no interest in your brand, they're not going to be liking and commenting on your post. Yeah. And so the algorithm is going to say 80% of this yeah. person's followers don't engage, not an interesting account, and they're going to demote you in the algorithm. So it's better to have fewer followers that are really engaged than to have... Okay. A ton of fake followers. All right. And just one last thing. The more followers you have, does that change the algorithm somehow? Does that, like, if you get up to 10,000, do you get more, do they show you more often or something? Or is there? Not, I mean, again, the algorithm is not public, so I can't tell you for sure oh, one way or okay. another. It doesn't appear that that's true. I mean, the advantage of having 10,000 followers is, or, you know, lots of followers is this idea of, um, 
you know, exponential growth, right? So if you have 10,000 people that follow you and 1% of your audience sees your content um, or shares it with someone else, like it, it's easier to grow when you're already at a bigger base, right? It, um, yeah. But there's not uh, an indication that smaller accounts are gonna get less shown, shown to their own followers less. In fact, we see the opposite. So accounts that don't have a lot of followers um, typically see a larger percentage of their audience see their organic content than when you have a ton of followers, it's actually a smaller percentage that see it without any paid support. Um, so I don't think that's the case. The one advantage of having specifically that 10,000 follower mark is once you hit 10,000 followers, you get the ability in Instagram stories to add swipe up links. So you'll probably notice if you look through Instagram stories that on some of them, they'll say like, hey, check out these sunglasses, you know, swipe up to, to buy them or swipe up to see them. And when you swipe up on that story, it takes you to a website. So that ability to link from stories is available two ways. One is if you have 10,000 or more followers. The other is if you pay for Instagram story ads and that will give you the ability to add a swipe up feature on them as well. Thanks so much. Yeah. And then Hannah, we had um, a few people who are asking questions in the chat who were having trouble with their hand up feature. So Michelle has a question if she wants to jump in. Oh, sorry. I just spent 10 minutes typing them in the chat because I was told I had to put it over there. But yeah, this is much better. I have two hashtag handles. One yeah. is my Instagram name. One is my business name. Somebody when you, else. When somebody you say else hashtag handles, do you, do you mean like the at sign handle? No, or? At, like hashtag Hennessy Jewelry. Hashtag okay. main jewelry, my two. Okay. Right, the yeah. branding. Branding. Yes. Somebody else has started using one of the brands the one that's the same as my inst my social media name. And she is incredibly prolific, will post multiple times a day. So my stuff is getting wiped out. My other name is used only by me and occasionally by a guy in Croatia who posts cars. So it's safe to use that one. But what can I do about my old posts? Is it okay? Is it worthwhile to go back through my old comments and add that other hashtag? Or should I even bother? Yeah, you can definitely do that. I mean, I might, uh, if you're going to start using that new hashtag, that is obviously a danger, like nobody technically owns hashtags, right? Yeah. So other people can start using them and posting content that doesn't make sense for your brand. Um, and so if you want to switch over to that other one, I would maybe go back and choose, you know, 15 or 20 posts that you're going to add that hashtag to just so that your content starts to, um, okay you know, have well, a presence. I, uh, sorry, sorry. I, I often use both, but sometimes I only use one or the other. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, as long as you're using whatever one you're deciding on now that you're going to use, um, I would make sure that you at least have, you know, that, that hashtag on a good number of your posts so that you start to have a presence there. But I don't think okay. you need to go back and delete the other hashtag or, um, you know, okay. I, I don't think you need to or add it in to posts that are three years old or something like that. As long as you have a decent number of posts there, I think it's fine. Okay. Can I ask a quick question about Shopify? Yeah. I might not okay. know the answer, but you can ask. No, no, that's, that's okay. I, I have, I have Shopify and it's linked to my Instagram so I can tag products in my posts. Yeah. And, and every session I've ever been to on how to get more on Instagram, everything from Shopify, even Instagram is always saying tag your products in your posts. But when I do that, the view rate plummets to like 25% or less of all my other posts. Do you know why there's a disconnect between what everybody tells me I should be doing and how Instagram handles those posts? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, to be honest, I, I haven't heard that, but that's interesting to hear. And I, um, I'll i just tell you what my guess is. And this is totally just okay. my personal opinion. Um, so one thing could be that, uh, Instagram wants you to run ad shoppable ads. And so they may be sort of punishing people that are run that are using shoppable posts, but not sort of paying to promote them um, by sense. reducing the reach. <laughs> so I know that sounds <laughs> yeah. like a conspiracy theorist, but that that would be oh, no, opinion. no, that's a business decision, not a conspiracy. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. 
Hannah, Lil's been uh, raising her hand for a bit there. Sure. Okay, I've got a couple of questions. Um, we touched base um, before on Etsy. Did you find out if, or, or maybe I missed it, whether um, you can connect Instagram to Etsy, you know, even through an ad? Or was that something? Um, I haven't. I haven't yet. I can do a, I mean, I, my assumption is it's a pretty quick answer. It is possible to enable shoppable Instagram product tagging from Etsy. So, yeah. Oh, good. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. The right answer. <laughs> and the, I know. And the other question I have, or one other, um, what do you have, do you feel strongly about, like I have an Etsy site and I haven't built a separate website because I'm like, well, if I have one and I'm driving business there, do I need the other? What are your thoughts about that? I don't think that you need to have both. I guess the question that I would be asking myself if I were you, I mean, Etsy has relatively high fees depending on the setup that you have. And if and so the benefit that Etsy provides to people essentially in exchange for those fees is that you are in their database of products. So if someone, you know, they have a brand reputation, right? So people go to Etsy for a certain type of thing. And if they type in, you know, Mother's Day necklaces, you might show up in search. That said, I will tell you, Etsy has also monetized their search. I'm sure if you're on there, you probably know that. So there's, they are prioritizing companies that are paying to show up in their search. Mm -hmm. um, but that that's sort of the benefit of being on Etsy is that they've built this brand and they have regular website traffic that comes there and searches for certain types of things. And so people might find your product that otherwise wouldn't. That said, if you feel like your brand has sort of been built up enough that you don't need that and people that you have enough, uh, you know, of a following or you feel confident in your ability to use whether it's social media ads or Google ads or create content that ranks in Google and you don't think you need that Etsy search engine to drive people to your brand, mm -hmm. then it's probably cheaper to create an e-commerce website that you can drive people to directly. Because the other risk with Etsy is you drive people to Etsy to buy your you know necklace and they get on etsy and they on the bottom it says you might also like and there's right. three competitors that are selling something <laughs> similar and they might click on one of those so yeah. that's the risk I, and i'm not anti etsy i think it's you know a great way for people to build small businesses but i do think there's a point where when you feel like you're ready to go on your own it probably makes financial sense and the reason why some people might have two is they're not quite ready to like leave the support of Etsy, but they also want to take the people that already follow them and give them a way to buy directly so they don't have to pay those fees. Yeah, that makes sense. And do you have, um, do you lean towards, I, I mean, like I know Shopify is one that has been mentioned before in, in you know, the, the uh, workshops that we've done. Um, you know, do you know of any platform that you would suggest is better than another perhaps? Yeah, I feel like I'm probably not super qualified to answer this question because I'm <laughs> not an e-commerce expert. Um, yeah. But I will say that from what I've heard, Shopify is sort of, it's like the Apple uh, Apple products of e-commerce websites. It's very user-friendly, intuitive, and it um, connects in with almost every other e-commerce related program. So if you're looking at, you know, analytics programs or, um, credit cards, like all of those things all work with Shopify. So there probably are less expensive, maybe more niche oriented e-commerce sites that work better, like for a certain industry or something like that. But you are more likely to need a developer to work with you on them. And you're more likely to run into issues if you're trying to connect it with constant contact or MailChimp or something like that. They might not have those built-in connections. Oh, okay. All right. Um, and can I ask just one more thing? Sure. Okay. Um, Instagram and Pinterest. How do you? There's a way to connect them as well, correct? You have to build a board on on Pinterest for the business. Yeah. So to be totally honest, I don't use Pinterest a ton, um, but also I'm working. I'm I work with brands that tend. 
I guess, I don't know, I'm saying this wrong. I don't work with as many brands that are selling like a Pinterest type product, right? Pinterest works really well for certain types of uh, products and companies. Mm -hmm. And I just haven't worked a ton in that space. Um, but I believe you can uh, integrate them. You can certainly, you know, link back and forth between your accounts and you can pin your Instagram images on Pinterest. Um, and that's, you know, so one thing that people, users were frustrated with Pinterest for is they started having a lot of images up there that didn't link anywhere that were just pasted, you know, people would upload photos. And so you would be, you know, planning your wedding and you <laughs> would pin this photo of a dress and then you'd go like, okay, I want to actually buy that dress and you'd click on it and you can't find out who made it or where it's from or anything. And people were frustrated. Okay. And so Pinterest is trying to encourage people to actually link. So one of the things, and this is something that some people do if you don't have necessarily your own e-commerce website, is they would post things on their Instagram account and then pin the Instagram photo. So that at least links back to your, like some sort of space that, that people know that you created this. So if you make children's clothes or something, they can at least then try to find you through Instagram versus if you upload a photo to Pinterest and it doesn't go anywhere, people don't know how to contact you. Okay. Oh, that's great. All right. I won't take up any more time. Thank you very much, Hannah. I appreciate sure. it. All right. So next it looks like we have, um, thanks everyone for bearing with us, just making sure we get to everyone. So it looks like we have Kim and then Janet and then Joan. Um, if I missed you in the line, feel free. If you're not able to raise your hand, just type in the chat, raise hand, and then we'll get you in the line. But it looks like Kim, you're up next. Oh, you're still on mute, Kim. Hey, Kim, I think you're still on mute. So if you go to the, there you go. Okay, I'm, I'm there. Hannah, have you heard of these group initiatives where a group of people come together? It could be all of us. And everyone agrees to post or repost one another's posts on Instagram. So I'm exposing everybody's posts to my people and vice versa. Yep, I have heard of them. Um, I think they make sense as long as everyone in it as long as it makes sense so like if everyone in this group wanted to do it it probably makes sense you're all artists and makers you have some you know you might have similar audiences for some of your products um so if it is sort of genuine and makes sense in that way then i think that's great what happens is sometimes these groups become like national um sort of they'll start like a Facebook group for an Instagram pod or those sorts of things. And there becomes like hundreds of people that don't have any real like connection to each other. And so what happens is random people are, are sharing your content, but there's, it's not something that the people that follow them would be interested in. And like, that's kind of a waste. Yeah. If it gets really big, sometimes Instagram will flag them. And there's something called a shadow ban on Instagram where like you'll think that your account is just running as normal, but you'll see your engagement and your views plummet. And basically Instagram is just not showing your content to anyone for a period of time. It's like a slap on the wrist. Um, and so that can happen if the groups get like really big because basically Instagram is just trying to crack down on anyone that's trying to beat the system. So if you're doing it in a way that you actually, you know, maybe you're part of a, you know, um, maybe you're a potter and you're part of a group of potters and you all want to get together and, um, and, and promote each other's content. I think that's great. And I don't think Instagram is going to have any issue with that. It's when it becomes like a giant group that's basically just trying to work to beat the algorithm and you don't have anything in common that it might be an issue. Yeah. Okay. And my, the, my second question is about using Instagram on your laptop or desktop so it's small it's frustrating to do everything on the phone how do you recommend one moves everything over to the laptop and uh, has an app there yeah so the short answer is you can't really um, Instagram is designed to be a mobile first app and so 
all of their features are not available on desktop. So you can like browse an Instagram account, um, but it's it, it they make it purposely really difficult to actually try to manage an account through desktop and you don't have access to a lot of the features that you do on mobile. The thing that I would say, and I think I mentioned this yesterday that can help is if you do connect your Instagram account to your Facebook account, you can go into your Facebook business page and you can actually um, respond to comments or messages and that kind of thing through your, your Facebook business page. Mm -hmm. um, so that makes it a little bit easier in terms of, uh, you know, keeping track of messages and replying to people, but it doesn't fix, like you can't see through the Facebook page. You can't see like posts that you were tagged in on Instagram or those sorts of things. So you do have to log into the mobile app to do that. There's some functionality. And to be honest, I'm not sure the full extent of like where it sort of ends in terms of functionality with using it on a desktop, but uh, it's pretty clunky. And I think that's that's on purpose because they want people to use it on, on mobile. One thing you can do is if you have a full size iPad, you can um, download the Instagram app on an iPad. That said, it will still, like it might be a little bit pixelated because essentially what they do is just you're downloading the iPhone app and then it's just making it bigger. And so things sometimes appear a little bit pixelated or weird on there, but it, it is a way to sort of enlarge it if you're having a hard time seeing things or reading. Good, thank you. Yep. Okay, so next up we have Janet. Hi. Um, I just started doing Instagram shopping, but I found that I couldn't use posts that I had tagged products. I couldn't use them as an ad. You can. Um, I'm not sure what might be going on. There's a lot of, you know, Facebook and Instagram advertising can be a little finicky, um, especially when it comes to targeting and that sort of thing. So there are limitations when you're doing shoppable, like tagged ads um, on who you can target, et cetera. So there might be some weird thing in there that's, that's making it an issue. Um, but you can run ads with tagged uh, content in them. One thing I would say is like, you might try just running the ad through business, like creating an ad in business manager and tagging the product versus um, creating a shoppable post and then trying to boost it or promote it. Um, I, there, are, and I don't know for sure, again, we, I can ask, we have um, a digital ad specialist at Ethos that I can ask, but there are all kinds of rules around like how many products can be tagged in the post in order to run it as an ad. So if you've tagged too many things, they might not be letting you select it. Similar things happen with, um, if you're running Instagram story ads. So what we do at the agency is we always create an ad like in business manager and run it. If you post an organic story and then try to promote it, there's a lot of things that will disallow it from being able to be used. For example, if you've used any of the interactive features besides a poll or something like that, it won't let you promote it. Um, like if you put a countdown on there or a donation button or something like that, it won't let you promote it. So there is likely some kind of weird rule like that that's deeming that particular post ineligible to be promoted. And I would go in and try to rebuild that post in Business Manager and run it as an ad um, and see if you have success there. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try it again. And is there any size file, um, number of pixels or whatever that works best with Instagram or? Yeah, so they've, I mean, recently become more flexible in that you can have portrait oriented and horizontal um, photos on Instagram. When we post on Instagram, the safest is 1080 by 1080 pixels. That's just square and it's the proper resolution for Instagram. You can also use that size on Facebook. So it's sort of like the universal number, I guess, um, but you can, and I don't have the numbers off the top of my head. Um, there's a, there's a, if you just type like Instagram photo sizes on Google, there's all kinds of charts that will show you like the different allowable sizes. But when we're creating things that are gonna be used on multiple platforms, we usually use that 1080 by 1080. Okay, thank you. Yep. Then up next, it looks like we have Joan. Hello, Hannah. I really appreciate you sharing your wealth of information. This is very wonderful. Also, thank you everyone for these great questions. It's just so, so helpful. It's shedding a lot of light. Um, 
I have a question regarding ads. Um, I am an artist and maker, which is a little bit confusing. However, my I want to develop a very high end serious um, brand for the artwork so that yeah, I just want to do that so I can be able to charge higher prices. My work is really, really time intensive and material expensive. So my, if you place an ad, does that somehow cheapen or devalue the item? And I'm only speaking out of, I guess, my personal experience when I am scrolling through Instagram and I see that it's quote promoted. I think it just comes down a notch in my, it's less trustworthy or I don't know, just I'd like your, your feedback or your, your thoughts on that. That's my top question. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think the answer is it depends. Uh, and I think it comes down to how well done the ad is. So I definitely think that people are more likely to just try to scroll past things that jump out at them as an ad. And one of the things that we're always trying to focus on at the agency is creating ads that don't look like ads, especially when it comes to social media. And this can be a struggle for brands because a lot of times they're very caught up in like, we have to have our brand look, we have to have our logo really big, we have to have, you know, they have all these rules about what ads need to look like. And I turn blue in the face telling them you're working against yourself here. When you're on social media, it has to look like it's re real content that somebody would share. Um, so I think there are some things you can do to try to make the content look as sort of organic as possible, even though of course it will have that you know promoted tag on it. Um, a couple other things, we've seen a lot of success with Instagram story ads versus feed ads. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is because it's less obvious if you create a good looking Instagram story ad that looks organic, it's less obvious that it's an ad when you're scrolling through stories. Um, the second reason is because in Instagram stories, people are used to swiping up for more information. That's what they're accustomed to doing. In the Instagram feed, people are not used to clicking on something and going to a website because organic posts don't have links in them. So it's just not an action that people are accustomed to taking. So we will still use Instagram story feed ads as an awareness tactic to try to make sure that people recognize a brand name or come across a product that they might be interested in. But we don't use it as much as a sales tactic because people are just not used to clicking to buy something from the Instagram feed. That might change over time, especially as shoppable posts get more popular. Um, but for now, we've had a lot, a lot of success using Instagram stories. The other thing is, this is a great, this is what influencers can be so great for, because they have sort of real person accounts, and you essentially pay them to promote your product. So they'll, they do have requirements around putting things like hashtag sponsored or hashtag ad um, on their content, but it's usually pretty, um, you know, deep in the copy or something, it's not as obvious. And so they can promote your product and have it look um, more natural, I guess, and less like an ad and still reach a ton of people for a good price. Thank you so much. Sure. Okay, and it looks like Deb has a question. Um, and again, if we missed your question, feel free to write, type raise hand in the chat or raise your hand if you can enable that feature. But um, Deb, go, go right ahead. This Deb? <laughs> Deb Panish. Yeah, so I am wondering, um, I have an Etsy store um, full-time with employees. I'm really busy. Um, and I know there are people out there to hire to do all this work. I don't have the time to do that, um, nor the desire. Um, do you have any recommendations of people to hire to do that? So uh, I, I don't know, I think it depends on a, on a few things. One, and I don't know what your, your brand or product is, so it's a little bit harder, but especially for like art and, and home, you know, sort of handmade goods, a lot of the appeal of those products to people is the story behind them and the person behind them. 
And so again, I don't know your specific situation, but one thing that I caution people against in completely outsourcing their social media is a lot of times what you will get is sort of generic content. And that's just not going to engage people in the same way that that real personal content will. So my advice to you, but I totally get that people are busy and, and don't have time. I think I personally think it's impossible to 100% outsource your so social media. Um, my suggestion would be try to find somebody local. I know it's challenging with the pandemic yeah. right now, right? Because we're trying to not all be together. But if we ever get back to the place where we can be in rooms together, um, somebody local that can actually come and like be, oh, I don't know if you have a studio or, you know, or, or film you or, you know, and they can help you with sort of the posting and the, con the conceptual, like what types of content are we going to create and when are we going to post it and running ads and deal with sort of all of that. But I would um, think that you probably still want to be the face of your brand to some extent, or at least involved in the social media piece of it to give it that human aspect. Um, that said, you know, depending on your brand, like obviously the person that owns Coca-Cola is not like on their social media, right? If it's a brand that, that maybe doesn't require that sort of personal story, there are ways that a, another person can, can create that content for you. But again, they're going to need access to your product. So one of the ch most biggest challenges for us at Ethos is when we're managing social media accounts for our clients, at this point, I, they send you know, I have a, a team of people that I work with. And so they send us their product that we actually have in our homes and try to use. And um, so that we can create good content that actually involves the product. What's really hard is when clients want you to use like stock images or, you know, just graphics to create content for them. It just never performs as well. So the more authentic and personal the content is, the better it performs almost across the board. So there are certainly people and depending on your budget, you know, an agency is going to cost more than a freelancer. Um, there are websites out there like Fiverr. Um, and there's a number, if you just Google social media freelancers in Maine, there's like a number of websites where you can find people who are working in that space and, and talk to them about it. But I would you know, there are, there are also, and I'm not going to name any names, I don't want to throw anyone under the bus, but there are certainly people and agencies out there that take on a hundred clients. They create the same content calendar and then just change up the image or buy different stock images to go with it. And that, that's just not going to be super successful. So finding someone that shares your vision, shares your values, and ideally is local and able to come and take photos and videos of your actual process is ideal. Yeah, no, I do all the photos and I do work with someone right now, but I'm, I'm looking for someone else. Um, and I sell supplies, not um, a piece of art. Um, but thank you. Yeah, I mean, if you're taking all the images and you just need someone to manage like posting and, and running ads for you, I think certainly you can find that. Um, I don't know, uh, you know, the people that I work with are working at agencies, so they're not typically freelancing, but um, I would think certainly if you put either a, a job listing up for it or looked on some of those freelancing websites, there's one called like Cup of Joe, I think. Um, or Cup Fiverr. of Joe? Cup of Joe, I think. This was, I don't know, you know, it's been a while since I have done freelance work. So I don't know if that's still one of the um, popular ones. But um, when I was doing freelance copywriting, I was able to get some gigs on there. So there's, there's a number of different sites where you can try to find people. There's also an account, and this is kind of like a, uh, maybe a longer shot, but it's called work in social. They said it's an Instagram account. It's kind of a, a satire type account where it, a lot of social media managers follow the account. And there's a lot of memes and stuff about, you know, the, the nice and not so nice parts of the job. Um, but they do post job listings on there. So if you're looking for someone, you can send them a message and say, hey, would you post this job listing? And sometimes they'll share it with you there. And that's a big community of social media managers who are potentially looking for work. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. And then it looks like we're coming up on time, but it looks like we have two more questions. So maybe we'll try to squeeze those in. Um, so we have Colin and then Jennifer. Hi. Um... I wonder if you've maybe already said this, how do you find an influencer? 
I mean, I know, I know the type of person you're looking for and yes. for your business. I, I get that, but how do you even? It depends on the type of influencer you're trying to work with. So if you're trying to work with a big name, like a hundred thousand followers type of influencer, there are, most of them are managed by either um, influencer agencies or they have managers just like celebrities have, um, you know, whatever, I don't know what they call them, some sort of business manager. Um, and so there are, if you Google, you know, influencer marketing agencies, like there will be some that will come up and they work with, a lot of them are in different fields. So there's like people that work with lifestyle influencers, family influencers, food influencers. Um, and you can sort of find an agency that can help connect you with their, um, okay. you know, pool of talent essentially. For smaller influencers, like so I would, I would call a micro influencer, someone that has between 10,000 and a hundred thousand followers. Those people you can often find just by searching different hashtags related to your brand on Instagram. And then looking at some of the people that are posting that have a, a bunch of followers. So you can literally just search on Instagram for them. Um, and then a lot of times what happens is if you can find one, they're partnering with other similar influencers and that circle like builds out and out and out. So I, I can give you an example. We worked with the Wild Blueberries, um, Wild Blueberry Commission, and we were looking for dietitians who are influencers. Mm -hmm. And so once you find sort of one person and we started working with this woman, Ann Monty, and she had a really big following and a blog. Uh, so we found her through Google and then looked up her social profiles. And then, you know, we said to her, do you know of any other dietitian influencers? And we also were able to just look through her content and see people she had tagged. We looked at, you know, a lot of these dietitians go on these trips to, you know, um, Bing Cherries does like an influencer trip and, you know, California Walnuts does their thing. And so you can look at their social accounts and see what influencers they're working with. And anyway, it just sort of sp spiders out like that. Um, but someone's profile will actually say that they're an influencer? No, but it will say how oh. many followers they have. So okay. if somebody has a lot of, anyone can be an influencer, right? Oh, like if okay. you, if, if someone has 30,000 followers and you think that they, their values and the type of thing they post aligns with you. You just, it's just reaching out. That's all yeah. we're doing at the agency is sending them a message or an email and saying, hi, you know, we, I represent Coombs Maple Syrup and we're wondering if you're interested in partnering with us to create content or whatever. Okay. And they'll say yes or no, or they'll say, let me connect you with my manager, my business manager. Um, and then for smaller, so what I call nano influencers. Um, and I think someone answered a question, Amy answered the question in the comments here. These are just regular people that use social media and maybe have, uh, you know, between one and 10,000 followers. And they can be great influencers because they often have higher engagement with their posts because the people that follow them are literally their, just their friends and family and people okay. trust friends and family the most. And yeah. a lot of times they don't require payment. You can offer them free product um, or a discount in exchange for posting about it. And that's, you know, start by looking at who at your existing customers and seeing if any of them are willing to do that, your email list. Um, you can also, we've done this for a number of accounts when we're looking for nano influencers is just create an ad that says, you know, um, for example, Oakhurst is looking for brand ambassadors and, you know, here, email us if you're interested um, or you can create an online sign up and you can get people through that as well. Okay. And then one last question, uh, hopefully a quick sort of quick answer. I am horrible at sales and I never know what uh, I, I feel like I want to I want to post some stuff on Instagram and and put my products and my jewelry out there but I but I hate sounding like I'm selling it um even though I am <laughs> I don't want to sound that way so I usually just post a picture with nothing and um so is is learning what to what good content is is that is that something like teachable, <laughs> teachable, or is that just a personality trait that yeah, I Yeah, No, I mean, every, everyone's <laughs> going to have a little bit of a different tone and personality on social media. And so it, part of it is just finding your voice, but I would encourage you to follow other jewelry accounts and see what they're doing and see, you know, what sounds good to you and what you like, and just, you know, try to get some inspiration from what other people are doing. I still do that all the time when I'm thinking about what I'm going to post. I have certain accounts that I love what they do and I go on and see what they're doing and use that for inspiration. 
Um, so I would do that. I definitely would encourage you to put some words with your photos because even though you know that the jewelry is the product you're selling, other people might be like, is she selling the, the holder that it's hanging on? Or does she, you know, is it a paint color on the wall? Like they don't even know what it is you created. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't have to say, hi, buy this. It costs, you know, $65. You can just tell the story behind it. You know, this mother of pearl necklace was inspired by, you know, whatever. Um, <laughs> and, and tell them a little bit about how you made it and why, and you know, what you love about it. And uh, you know, I do think at some point, it, and you know, my dad works in development for a university and he always tells me like, you know, you don't get any money without asking for it. Mm -hmm. um, so at some point, I think you do want to sort of in, in a gentle way, not in all of your posts, but in some of them, you know, say to people, you know, I'm selling this and this is how I make my living and, you know, mm -hmm. and people will hopefully support you. Um, but if that feels uncomfortable, you can certainly just start with the sort of the story behind it. Okay, I want you to get to the next person. Thank you so much. Sure. Okay, so it looks like we're coming up on time. And Jennifer, I think your question was also about influencers. Um, so I don't know if we covered it or if you have anything else, but we could probably take, we're good? Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, Lisa, do you wanna take over? Anna, thank you so much. That was a lot of content again, and I hope everyone found some nuggets to help them better navigate social media. Thanks for being on the hot seat with us. Um, we're going to be going through the video and, and pulling out any resources and sharing them. Uh, anything that was described today, we'll send along in a follow-up email, so keep your eyes open for that. Um, thank you to our sponsor, Ethos, for supporting our creative economy work. And please visit the Creative Economy Hub on the Island Institute page and the Artists and Makers Week page for these and other resources. There's still lots of time to finish your stack for today's daily art prompt. So be sure to join us uh, in doing that. And we hope you'll join us for tomorrow. It's gonna be a special live daily art prompt event with Kim Bernard where we're, we'll each create a piece of a mystery word together. So we hope you'll join us for that. Thanks so much, everyone. It's nice to see some of your faces today. I'm sorry we couldn't be together in person, but I hope you all enjoy the warm weather and we hope to see you soon. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>